Celebrations all over the United Kingdom today to mark the 100th birthday of Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother. Thousands packed into the centre of London around Buckingham Palace to see her for themselves, the first member of the royal family ever to reach such a great and symbolic age. She played a full and public part in the celebrations and said later she was touched and deeply grateful for the welcome she's received. Our royal correspondent Jenny Bond on the Queen Mother's big day. <laughs> years old and according to her family still full of vigor vitality and enjoyment of life no other king or queen in British history has lived so long and the Queen Mother is said to be quietly very pleased indeed that she's achieved this landmark anniversary At such a grand age, it seemed reasonable to assume that she might want to sit down for a moment, and her page, who's been with her for 50 years, was clearly watching out for her. But despite a word of persuasion from Prince Charles, she refused the offer of a chair. Cards and presents have been arriving at Clarence House by the sackful. In the past 24 hours alone, 60 mailbags have been delivered. But today there was a special delivery from the Queen's personal postman, Tony Nichols, a 100th birthday card for her mother. It was one of 12 that were sent from the palace to centenarians today, but it proved a little tricky to open. So the Queen Mother called on the assistance of her equerry and his sword to solve the problem. And this card had a handwritten message from the Queen. It said the whole family joined her in sending loving best wishes on this special day. And it was signed, Lilibet. Outside the gates, the crowd had swelled to 40,000, lining the route from Clarence House all the way to the palace. To give as many people as possible the best view, the Queen Mother abandoned her traditional walkabout and took to a horse and carriage with Prince Charles at her side. The carriage was decorated with garlands of blue and gold flowers, the Queen Mother's racing colours. The Prince has accompanied his grandmother to several of the birthday celebrations leading up to today. Their relationship is close and affectionate, and he has said he stands in awe of her indomitable spirit. By any standards, this is a truly remarkable day. The Queen Mother has been part of a century of history, and today the crowds are here to pay tribute to her. A 41-gun salute was sounded as the procession passed through the gates of the palace where the Queen and about 30 members of the royal family were waiting. And that was the signal for the crowds at Clarence House to surge down the mall in scenes reminiscent of great occasions of years gone by. The Queen Mother had told her friends that she didn't think the crowds would be any bigger this year than usual. She couldn't have been more mistaken. I just love everything about her and she's just such a wonderful person. How many of us get to a hundred? I think it's fantastic for her to get to a hundred. There really is a wonderful atmosphere, everybody's wonderful, it really is a party atmosphere, fantastic time. At just after half past twelve, the moment they'd been waiting for, as the Queen Mother stepped out onto the balcony with her two daughters. This was not only a national occasion, it was a family birthday party and all the Queen Mother's grandchildren and great-grandchildren were there. Prince William, who stood with his father and Prince Harry, is already a crowd puller in his own right. And this was certainly a day to remember for all four generations, spanning a century. But this was the Queen Mother's day, someone who, for most of us, has quite simply always been there. And tonight, defying her 100 years, the Queen Mother was at the Royal Opera House with her daughters to see the Kirov Ballet. Clearly, she has no intention of slowing down in her second century. Jenny Bond, BBC News. The celebrations weren't just in London. Across the country, bells were rung and parties held, particularly for the 11 other centenarians who share the Queen Mother's birthday. The 9 o'clock news special correspondent Ben Brown on the festivities around the UK.
Across the kingdom, they've been ringing out the bells for the Queen Mother today, and nowhere more so than the church where she was christened a century ago in the Hertfordshire village of St Paul's Walden. And there was a very special happy birthday too from Glam's Castle in Scotland, where the Queen Mother spent so much of her childhood as the then Elizabeth Bowes Lion. 21 gun salutes blasted out to mark this her centenary. Fired from the ramparts of Edinburgh Castle. From Hillsborough Castle in Northern Ireland. And from Cardiff City Hall, commemorations countrywide to mark a moment of royal history. Happy birthday, dear Gladys. No gun salutes today, but plenty of singing for the country's other centenarians like Gladys Stickland near Marlborough in Wiltshire. Hooray! Hip, hip. Hooray! And of course, like the Queen Mother, the special delivery of that telegram from the Queen. Thank you very much. Thank you. She couldn't wait to read it out. I send my congratulations and best wishes you with such a special occasion, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah. Lovely, very nice indeed. It was lovely. Like Happy birthday. There was champagne flowing too for Nellie Fort in Newcastle, also 100 years old today, also delighted to have reached her century. It's very nice and thank you. In this street at Denham, west of London, named after the Queen Mother, pensioners are holding a party tonight in her honour. They say she's been a beacon all through their lives. It's marvellous. She's lasted the year 2000. And also, her birthday's come on the year 2100. We think it's wonderful. It's worth, worth celebrating. And they're ready. That's it. They stand and racing. One tribute that will be particularly appreciated by the Queen Mother came at Glorious Goodwood today, with a race specially named after her birthday. And the crowd stood for the national anthem. In her favourite sport, this is one of her favourite courses, and there's nowhere she'll be prouder to have been honoured. Ben Brown, BBC News. The News of the World says it's dropping its campaign to name and shame convicted paedophiles. Since it started, there have been a number of vigilante-style attacks, some of them based on mistaken identity. Police have criticised the paper's tactics over the past two weeks. The government said it welcomed the paper's decision and it would be doing all it could to strengthen the laws to protect children. With little more than 24 hours to go before the presses start to roll for this Sunday's edition, staff at the News of the World prepared to announce a compromise, an end to its name and shame campaign in return for retaining the fight for what it's calling Sarah's Law, the right for the public to know if a paedophile lives in their area. We have decided to discontinue the naming procedure under which we identified with photographs convicted paedophiles in the newspaper. We will now begin discussions with Jack Storm and the Home Office. On the platform too, police and other agencies who spent days negotiating for the naming of paedophiles to stop. They say they found some common ground with the paper, though what that means in practice is still vague. I think we have an opportunity now to move forward uh, with a, a sense of uh, partnership to, to, to uh, implement new measures that will protect uh, children. The charred remains of a burnt out car, a tangible symbol of the vigilante attacks that have followed the paper's campaign. On the streets of Paulsgrove in Portsmouth last night, a large mob targeted this flat, the home of a sex offender who'd fled after being named by the paper. By morning, things had calmed down, but many neighbours approved of the action. I'm very pleased for what the people's done. I know you all think, well, they've gone over the top, like with the car and whatever the case may be. But what they've done, they've cleaned out the rubbish. But there have been many instances of mistaken identity. The latest, this pensioner from Croydon. Letters were sent to hundreds of his neighbours, warning them to be on their guard. He's furious. Why was I targeted? Who targeted me? Where they got the information from to target me? The naming and shaming campaign now dropped. The ball's been kicked into the government's court. My first concern has to be the protection of children and the maintenance of public order. And as such, I welcome the News of the World's announcement. What I'm also committed to is what this government has embarked upon year on year since we were first elected to office, which is strengthening the law in relation to the protection of children. 
The paper's campaign for a Sarah's law has focused on a public register of paedophiles, but many working with offenders are likely to remain gravely concerned about how access to this information is controlled. After nearly a fortnight in which public feelings have been running high, today's deal lowers the temperature of the debate. But the paper will continue to fight for changes in the law and demand that the government tackles the issues head on. Karen Allen, BBC News, Wapping. After a week-long build-up, George W. Bush has formally accepted the Republican nomination to run for president. Addressing delegates on the last day of his party's convention in Philadelphia, he accused Bill Clinton of failing to lead and of squandering America's prosperity. The Texas governor, who's trying to follow his father to the White House, called for a new beginning when voters go to the polls in November. George Bush had the party faithful in the palm of his hand. This his opportunity to win over the nation beyond. Just eight years ago, George Bush the elder was the nominee. It is an extraordinary family story. And I want to thank my dad, the most decent man I have ever known. Democrats say a daddy's boy is bidding for the White House. But last night, George W. Bush outlined his own vision. Prosperity conservative, but not strident. Big government is not the answer. But the alternative bureaucracy is not indifference. It is to put conservative values and conservative ideas into the thick of the fight for justice and opportunity. This is what I mean by compassionate conservatism. And on this ground, we will lead our nation. His other theme, wasted opportunity. American prosperity squandered by the Democrats. Our current president embodied the potential of a generation. So many talents, so much charm, such great skill. But in the end, to what end? So much promise to no great purpose. The speech was a crucial test. It ended with adulation. It wasn't explosive oratory, but it was skilled politics. Republicans got their red meat, tax cuts, a stand against abortion. But the emphasis was on inclusion, not confrontation. And now Bush's chief strategist is claiming that key political asset, momentum. Where does the Bush campaign stand? the morning after the convention? Well, we stand on the, on the verge of a very tough, spirited contest. 96 days to go until the November election, and it will be a tough contest. As he left Philadelphia today, George Bush was all smiles. The first post-convention polls give him a big lead over Al Gore. George Bush is now taking his message across the country, convinced that he's winning the battle for the political center ground. The Democrats' convention is in 10 days' time. Al Gore has to find a way to stop this Republican bandwagon. Stephen Sacker, BBC News, Philadelphia. Officials investigating last week's crash of an Air, Force, uh, Air France Concorde say a piece of metal which didn't come from the airliner has been found among debris on the runway. They've also found evidence the plane veered to the left on takeoff. 114 people died when Concorde crashed two minutes into its flight. Air France's Concorde fleet may soon be flying again. Grounded since last week's disaster, there's fresh evidence tonight that the tragedy wasn't caused by a structural fault with the plane. The Concorde appears to have been a victim of circumstance. The runways at Paris's main airports are checked regularly by mobile patrols, but it looks as though the Concorde ran into a piece of metal lying on the tarmac. The crash investigators have found the metal amongst debris on the runway. It seems to have burst one of the plane's tyres. The supersonic jet was seen veering to the left just before takeoff. The runway had been inspected a few hours before, part of a daily routine. We have three uh, visual inspections of the runways and at least one more for the integrity of the uh, runway lighting. But it wasn't enough. As the last few pieces of wreckage are removed from the crash site, the sequence of events which brought the plane down is now much clearer. When the tyre was punctured, pieces of the wheel or undercarriage spun off, piercing the fuel tank and causing an uncontrollable fire. The piece of metal found on the runway was just 40 centimetres long, but investigators believe it still set off a catastrophic chain of events. 
In future, any airport used by Concorde will have to conduct much more rigorous checks before every takeoff or landing. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Paris. Here, a man's been charged with escaping from custody after yesterday's armed breakout from Slough Magistrates Court. The 22-year-old was recaptured in Maidenhead last night and will appear before a special sitting of a magistrate's court tomorrow. The police are still looking for three other men. Six detectives from the same crime squad at East Dulwich in London have been found guilty of a series of drugs and corruption offences at the Old Bailey. Police say the case represents one of the biggest anti-corruption investigations carried out in recent years. The high street banks have been told by the government to give a better service to their customers. The Treasury, in its response to a damning report that accused the banks of overcharging, also called for league tables so that customers can compare services and charges. Soaring temperatures in California are threatening the state with widespread electricity cuts, putting Silicon Valley, the heart of the world's high-tech industry, at risk. Power companies say if the heat wave continues, they'll be forced to switch off parts of the supply, or the entire grid system could fail. Parts of the state are also battling with widespread forest fires. From California, David Willis reports. Licking their way across the west coast, forest fires fueled by one of the hottest summers for many years. They're feasting on a timber-dry landscape and have already engulfed an area the size of Oxfordshire. California's long, hot summer is creating a host of problems, and these firemen are not the only ones feeling the heat. Uh, At the nerve centre of the local electricity company, engineers are fighting a battle of their own. Demand for power has hit record levels as the most populated state in the union turns to fans and air conditioning in order to stay cool. With reserves at a 30-year low, there simply isn't enough electricity in the grid to go round. The heat wave has revealed a system at breaking point to the surprise of many who never expected that demand would exceed supply. In the United States, we expect that the Roy's going to have the electrical power we need and it's uh, becoming a, a surprise that for the first time that we may not have electrical power that we need to support our operations. A surprise to some, a wake-up call to others. Suddenly it's time to do your aerobic exercises in the pool rather than use up all that air conditioning. The grid has been brought to its knees by this country's voracious appetite for computers, fax machines and VCRs. America is paying the price for its economic boom. Faced with a situation which could jeopardise the entire national grid, the authorities may have little option but to pull the plug. This vast state is now preparing for a series of rolling and random blackouts which would raise serious questions about America's ability to cope with the digital age. Off lights that aren't being used. The authorities concede it's too big a problem to solve simply by conserving energy. Just doing my part to keep America energy efficient. And this is the main culprit. California's Silicon Valley, the birthplace of the internet, guzzles electricity faster than any area of its size anywhere else in the world. The energy required for this microprocessing plant could power 50,000 homes, but soon Silicon Valley could be shuddering to a halt. If the lights were to go out in one of those companies that are part of the backbone of the internet, um, the lights could go out beyond just the borders of California and the United States, and quite literally around the world, uh, computer screens could possibly go dark. The area has already had a taste of the chaos a blackout could bring. When a workman accidentally cut through a cable, the traffic lights went blank, and Silicon Valley lost $100 million in a matter of hours. It's more than a decade since the last power station was built here. This wealthy region may rue that delay if the lights go out. David Willis, BBC News, California. Here, the children's charity Childline is struggling to help many of the children who ring its helpline. Because of a shortage of counsellors, a lot of its calls are being put through to an answering service. Childline admits there's a problem and says it needs more money to deal with rising demands for its advice. Childline is supposed to provide a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week counselling service to children in distress. But the charity has been failing to give children the listening and comfort it was set up to provide. Childline, Childline says it receives around 15,000 calls a day. Most callers get a recorded message, 
Only 3,500 calls are answered by an operator. Most of those queries are dealt with. Out of those, 400 children are then put through to a trained counsellor. But that's less than 3%. This is the fifth time I've tried to ring the helpline, but every time so far, all I get is the answer phone. Hello, this is Childline. All our counsellors are busy... It may be that on the day, you know, the child is in the phone box, utterly desperate, having had the most horrific experience, they can't reach us. It is just not good enough, and we know it, and we're working at it. Other children's charities say it's vital that a distressed child should have someone to talk to. I think it takes a lot of courage for a child to call in the first instance and they might think, I'll get help, I'll get help. And if they don't, who knows how long before they call again and perhaps they won't. For young people, the lack of service has come as disappointing news. I think that's out of order because if someone is being bullied and they don't have anyone to turn to, they should be there at the end. It's not fair that they ring up and there's no one there because so, they've got no one to solve their problem. These people are basically calling up to discuss their problems and pour out their heart, but there's nothing they, nobody can, they can talk to because nobody's there. The charity says it needs more money, but insists children should still try and ring. It's often the most vulnerable who turn to Childline for help. To find there's no one there can only add to their distress. Navdip Dariwal, BBC News. British diplomats will be allowed to visit the two British police officers who have been accused of spying and are being held in Belgrade. John Yaw and Adrian Prangnell were arrested on Tuesday, along with two Canadians, near the border between Montenegro and Kosovo. The Yugoslav authorities have used the arrest to put pressure on Montenegro's government, which is trying to loosen its ties to Belgrade. Brian Barron reports from the capital Podgorica on the rising tensions in the area. On a sunlit road, a carefree excursion could have ended like this. In recent weeks, the Yugoslav Army's special forces based here have been practicing such operations with chilling precision. The tempo of psychological warfare against Montenegro, Belgrade's reluctant partner in the Yugoslav Federation, has stepped up as President Milosevic seeks re-election next month. So far, the only glimpse of Adrian Prangnell from Hampshire and his fellow police officer John Yaw from Cambridgeshire has been on state TV. The army claims weapons and explosives were found when they and two Canadians were detained. Here in Podgorica, the Montenegrin government says the allegations are absurd. It blames Mr Milosevic. Well, he would like to present Montenegro as a very dangerous area for foreigners. What generally speaking, is far from being true. Realistically, how quickly would you hope to see these four men released? I hope it, will, it is a matter of day or two. This is Dragan Vukdalic, the honorary British consul who's written to the army commander for permission to see the arrested men. Today, the military refused a similar request when a Canadian diplomat turned up in person. This evening, there's one slight ray of hope. Confidential sources here so the Yugoslav army may be willing to hand over the arrested men to civilian police custody if their testimony holds up. The reality is it's President Milosevic in Belgrade pulling the strings. The army obeys his orders. Brian Barron, BBC News, Podgorica, Montenegro. England's cricketers have established a commanding position in the third test against the West Indies at Old Trafford. Having bowled the tourists out cheaply, they finished a thrilling second day, 39 runs ahead on 196 for three. And playing in his 100th test match, Alex Stewart scored an unbeaten century. Dave. After their morning heroics in bundling out the West Indies for 157, England were soon in familiar territory, trying to fend off Kirtley and Courtney. Walsh's opening spell was simply too good, even for a batsman like Mike Atherton playing in his 100th test. Walsh was involved in everything. He caught Nasser Hussain on the boundary, but then stepped over the rope. And instead of walking to the pavilion, the England captain was six runs better off. Revenge was sweet for Walsh, though. He produced another beauty to have Hussain caught by Adams. And with the next ball, outfoxed Graham Thorpe. Expecting the thudding blow, Thorpe got the sucker punch and Walsh had taken his third wicket of the innings without conceding a run. But this was an England story with a happy ending. 
Marcus Draskothic played like a veteran in his first test and with an unbeaten stand of 179, he and Alex Stewart powered past the West Indies with ease. Draskothic's 50 came up with a rousing six. And Alex Stewart rounded things off nicely, a century in his 100th test on a day when unbeaten hundreds were being celebrated everywhere. Neil Bennett, BBC News. And that's the main news tonight. Britain's been celebrating the 100th birthday of the Queen Mother. That's it. That's all from the BBC Nine O'Clock News tonight. Good night. Just about to begin on BBC News 24, a special programme marking the Queen Mother's 100th birthday. That's available on digital and cable. Good evening. Celebrations have been taking place throughout Scotland to mark the Queen Mother's 100th birthday. A 21-gun salute was fired from Edinburgh Castle. In the Highland town of Tain, there was a service of thanksgiving. But the centre of the celebrations has been at Glam's Castle, where the young Elizabeth Bowes Lyon spent much of her childhood. The Royal Birthday celebrations have a very personal focus at Glam's Castle. The Queen Mother's family in Scotland, the Bowes Lions, gathered here for a day of festivities with both the public who were visiting the Queen Mother's old home and tonight with around 300 estate workers. Outside all day, visitors have been entertained by pipe bands and country dancers, two of the birthday images of Glam's. The capital city saluted the Queen Mother with a 21-gun fusillade from the ramparts of Edinburgh Castle. In the royal borough of Tain in the Highlands, a procession along an ancient royal pilgrimage route ended with the playing of a pipe tune written specially for the Queen Mum. Later, local people who, like the Queen Mother, had lived through two world wars were presented with a commemorative £5 coin. Meanwhile, the residents of Glasgow's old folks' homes were all treated to birthday cake, courtesy of the city council. The occasion sparking reminiscences and continued admiration for the woman, once known by this generation simply as Queen Elizabeth. Other news now. Strathclyde police are warning the public not to approach a man who was released by mistake from Scotland's first privatised jail in Kilmarnock. 33-year-old James Montgomery was let out two days ago due to an administrative blunder. In a statement, the Scottish Prison Service blames what it calls an administrative error for the mistaken release of a remand prisoner from Kilmarnock Prison on Wednesday. Strathclyde police, who were notified at lunchtime today, are now searching for 33-year-old James Montgomery, who's described as being of medium build, with dark hair and blue eyes. They're advising the public not to approach him, but ask that any sightings of him be reported to the police. The duty director at the prison says an internal investigation is now underway to establish exactly how the mistake happened. A mother who threw her six-year-old son to his death from the tower block home in Glasgow has been sentenced to five years in jail. 26-year-old Alison Campbell had been receiving hospital treatment since pleading guilty to killing her son. But today a judge ruled she wasn't seriously mentally ill. The government has denied its planning to privatise the country's nuclear deterrent, the Trident submarine base on the Clyde. It said that passing work to the Babcock Engineering Group would help cut overcapacity at the base, but unions claim a private contractor is poised to take over the security and maintenance of the submarines. Well, that's all for now. I'll be back over on BBC Two Scotland in Newsnight Scotland at 11. Until then, good night. Hello, good evening. There has been some warm weather around today. Temperatures in Leon Solent climbed as high as 24 degrees Celsius and it looks like it's going to stay rather warm and humid throughout tonight and tomorrow as the wind stays in the west or the southwest. Tonight temperatures will fall no lower than 12 or 13 degrees in most spots and to the west it's going to be even warmer than that as temperatures drop no lower than 14 to 16. Here the cloud will be thick enough for some drizzle or rain from time to time and it's going to turn quite misty with some patchy fog on northern and western facing coasts and hills. If you're heading out in the car later on tonight and through tomorrow, driving conditions could be quite difficult here.
and this is where we're likely to see some drizzle or some rain, perhaps the odd heavier burst of rain in northwestern parts of Scotland from time to time. But further towards the east, it's going to be a drier day. There'll be a little bit of brightness or sunshine coming through, but any sunshine could set off one or two light showers in eastern England through the afternoon. Now here we're going to see temperatures climbing to between 23 and 25 degrees Celsius. For the west, where it stays cloudier, we'll see temperatures of around 18 or 19. But even here, it is going to feel quite muggy. Now that humid air is heading in behind this warm weather front. But on Sunday, this cold front is going to sink southwards across Scotland. And that's going to change the wind direction. Now you can just about make out here the difference in colour of these wind arrows, green arrows, showing that that northwesterly wind will be a little bit cooler and fresher. But at the same time, it's going to brighten up across Scotland. It'll feel quite pleasant with a temperature of 17 to 19 degrees. Meanwhile, a band of cloud and light rain will push southwards across Scotland into Northern Ireland and eventually Northern England. To the south of this band of cloud and light rain, it is going to be quite warm and humid again. It'll be drizzly in western areas. Further towards the east, though, we should see a little bit of sunshine. But with these high temperatures in the southeast, we could see a sharp shower on Sunday afternoon. Have a good weekend. BBC One presents Michael Barrymore in a Broadway extravaganza. It's Showtime, folks. Featuring an all-star cast. Don't come across very sexual at all. No, I'm sorry, darling. Give what us a it? kiss. <laughs> you can't get one of these for love, no money. The lights, the atmosphere, the applause. I'm mad about musicals. Experience the magic of show business. Join me for Barrymore on Broadway. The curtain goes up tonight at 10.20 on BBC One. Friday night in with BBC One Sculpted and it takes two at their new time, McCabe and Cassidy. Badger.